If you're American, you might not instantly recognize what this map is showing, but chances are good you know exactly which of these divisions you fall into. We love to hear stories about their bridges, about their kings, and about their real housewives. That's right, counties. They're one of the basic forms of local government in the United States. But here's a question. How many counties are there? Let's Google it. Okay, how many counties in the U.S.? All right. 3,007, there you go. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that, and it's complicated in a way that we run into a lot when we study state and local governments. So let's dig into this question. Now this seems like it shouldn't be a complicated question. I mean, think about the ways that you interact with the government. Things like recycling pickup, paying your utility bill, going to a public park, bribing a sheriff's deputy with an Applebee's gift card, or voting in an election. Depending on where you live, those day-to-day -day tasks are handled by your county government. So if they're that big a part of providing government services, you'd think Congress would keep tabs on them and have a list somewhere where we could get a definite number of how many counties there are. But that's not the case. Why? The reason is federalism. Federalism is a way of organizing a place so that there's shared power between two or more levels of government. In the case of the United States, that means the national government, which we sometimes call the federal government, and the state governments. Now you might be asking, don't most countries have more than one level of government? Are they all practicing federalism? Well, some of them are, but there is a distinction here. For instance, France is broken up into regions which have elected governments and collect their own taxes, but they only exist because of a law passed by the national government, and the national government can change that law. Here in the United States, if the national government wants to exert a power over a state, it either has to have that power given to it in the U.S. Constitution, or it has to amend the Constitution. But remember, constitutional amendments require three-quarters of states to ratify that change. They can say no. Now granted, this is glossing over a lot of nuance in history about the balance of power in the United States. The general trend, especially since the 1930s, has been to read more and more national power into the U.S. Constitution without actually passing an amendment. But this is a subject that deserves its own deep dive in another video. Anyway, the upshot of this federalist design is that a lot of government decisions are left up to the states, and states can approach things differently. That's actually the source of the name of this channel. Back in 1932, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis described states as being laboratories, where they can experiment with different ways of doing things, and then the rest of the country can look to those examples and choose to adopt them or not. Because of this, you're going to hear a lot on this channel phrasing like, most states do this, or some cities do this, but some cities do that. Because a lot of things are not universal once you start looking across the country. One of those things is how states choose to organize themselves. Now, the U.S. Constitution says that states have to be republics, or representative democracies, but beyond that, there is a lot of freedom. For instance, 49 states follow the lead of the U.S. Congress and choose to have two chambers in their legislatures, like the House and the Senate, but Nebraska doesn't. They have a single chamber. Some states choose to elect their superintendent of public schools, others have that appointed by the governor. And relevant to this video, states get to choose how to divide themselves up and what sort of responsibilities to assign to their local governments. That brings us back to our original question. Looking across all the states, how many counties are there? Well, one thing you might have noticed is that I haven't defined what a county is yet, and there's a good reason for that. How you define a county determines how many there are. Maybe the obvious way to define a county is to count anything that calls itself a county. It seems pretty straightforward. If we do this, the number we get is 3,007. By this definition, Google is correct. Just because it's the easiest definition doesn't necessarily make it the most useful definition, though. If a political scientist is doing a study of counties across the country, they wouldn't want to leave something out that has all the features of a county but just isn't called one. And there's a big example of this. If we take a look at this map of Louisiana, you can see that it's divided up into 64 pieces. That's right around the average number you'd expect if these were counties, given Louisiana's population, and their governments have similar powers counties do in other states. The difference is that they're called parishes. Now, this is mostly a historical artifact of Louisiana's French and Spanish history, where the Catholic Church was a major organizing force. It doesn't really feel like these should be put into a different box than counties. But now we have to start asking, what is our definition of a county if we're going to include parishes? Are there other things that look like counties? 
can we assign every point in the United States to a county equivalent? Well, the wrong way to go about it is by defining counties in terms of what they do. Near the beginning of this video, I list things like garbage pickup and utilities as examples of things that some counties provide. But that's not the case everywhere. Within a state, counties might differ in their responsibilities based on population size or by what city governments provide within that county. One extreme example is Hawaii's Kalavao County. It's the smallest county in the country by area and by population, and it exists because the land used to be a leper colony. It has no county government and is instead run by the Hawaii Department of Health. But across states, the differences can be even bigger. If we look at Connecticut, for instance, they technically have counties, but they're essentially meaningless. There are no county governments or sheriff's departments. Everything is either handled at the state level or at the town and city level. The better definition might be this. Let's call counties the largest division of the state that completely covers the state. This makes a lot of sense looking at one of our boring states like Minnesota, and it even works just fine for Louisiana. So where does this change things? A big example would be Virginia, although there are a handful of examples elsewhere. If you look at a county map of the state, you'll notice a lot of small holes, some right in the middle of counties. These represent what are known as independent cities. Unlike cities in the rest of the country, they have no county government on top of them. They are part of that largest division of the state definition I just mentioned. Now you might object to this, and you wouldn't be completely wrong. Cities are not counties. But again, there's a ton of variation across the country, and independent cities are not completely unique. If you look at a recycling bin in Denver, you'll notice that they say the city and county of Denver. It's what's known as a consolidated city county, where the two levels of government are merged together. There are a few dozen of these across the country, and the only difference between them and an independent city is that an independent city doesn't pretend to have a separate county. So does this cover every state? Almost. Things get complicated when we talk about Alaska, just floating down there below California. For one thing, Alaska is a bit like Louisiana in that they don't call them counties. They use the term borough instead. But the differences go deeper if we look at the founding of the state. In the spirit of the laboratories of democracy, Alaska had 48 other states to look at when it was drafting its constitution in the 1950s, and they believed there were problems with how other states were handling their governments. You have to remember that two-thirds of the states had formed prior to the Civil War, when the country was still mostly rural. The large metropolitan urban areas that had developed since then were spilling over city and county lines, which was leading to inefficiency and conflict in how resources were being managed. So with this in mind, Alaska didn't completely divide itself up into organized boroughs like every other state does. Instead, Alaska started entirely as a giant, unorganized borough, which was managed mostly by the state government or by tribal governments. Since then, sections of the state have decided to form organized boroughs and take on those standard county sort of responsibilities, but just under half of the state is still in the unorganized borough. Although to be fair, this covers less than 15% of the state's population. What's also interesting is that Alaska has a high rate of boroughs being consolidated with city governments, which kind of makes sense given the ideas of the state's founders. Having no real boroughs to start out with wasn't a problem for Alaska, but there was one group that had an issue with it, the US Census Bureau. That's the agency that's in charge of counting where all of us live. If they wanted to report population counts at a scale finer than the state as a whole, what would they use? Well, in 1960, they used the state's election districts, which do cover the entire state, except that they change every 10 years. But in 1970, some boroughs had organized, so there were things like counties, but most of the state didn't fall under one. In response, the census took it upon itself to divide the unorganized borough into divisions, which since 1980 have been known as census areas. Again, these are divisions made by the federal government for statistical purposes and don't actually relate to any sort of local government unit. But the state of Alaska does use some of these statistics, so they at least recognize that these divisions exist. As a result, a lot of people follow the census's lead and treat these census areas as county equivalents. All right, so now we've discussed the 50 states. Going by everything we've discussed so far, including counties, parishes, boroughs, independent cities, and Alaskan census areas, the count we now have is 3,141. But I did say before, what if we could do this for every point in the United States? Despite the name, the United States is not just the states. First of all, we have Washington, D.C. Now, D.C. is divided up internally into wards, but these are essentially political districts, and they get redrawn every 10 years with each census. So most people count the city as one large equivalent to a county, 
kind of like one of Virginia's independent cities. That brings our total to 3,142, and that's where a lot of people draw the line. There's actually a hobby known as county collecting, where people try to visit every county in the United States, and there are websites that help people track their progress, and even annual meetings for people who are into it. These groups tend to use 3,142 as the goal number, and there are people who have done it. They've visited every single county in the country. But there's even more to the U.S. There's also the 14 territories of the United States. I'm going to exclude the two that are currently being contested by Columbia. So within those 14, do we also have county equivalents? Well, the census says yes. So let's take a look while I force you to learn some U.S. geography. Nine of these territories are islands with no permanent population. While the census does assign them state equivalent codes, it doesn't include them in their county equivalent releases, so I'm going to leave them out. Fun fact, many of these were claimed by the United States because they were literally full of crap. For places with people, we can start in the Caribbean. Puerto Rico doesn't have anything it calls a county, but it does have 78 municipalities which completely cover the territory. So these are used as parallels to counties. With the remaining four territories, things get a little bit dicier in terms of deciding what the equivalent is to a county. Federal agencies within the U.S. government don't even agree all the time. For instance, if we move over to the Pacific, Guam is also completely divided up into municipalities called villages, and the U.S. Geological Survey considers each of these to be a county equivalent. But the U.S. Census Bureau counts the entire territory as one big single county equivalent. Because we're already leaning on the census in Alaska, and because they're the ones who provide demographics and maps, I'm going to side with the census on this one. I, I apologize, Guam. Moving just north of Guam is the Northern Mariana Islands, which is divided up into four municipalities, which the census uses as its county equivalents. American Samoa has three districts and two atolls as its county equivalents. And finally, going back to the Caribbean, the U.S. Virgin Islands has three major islands, and each of the three is considered the base of a county equivalent. So that covers the territories, which adds in 91 new county equivalents. Added to our previous total of 3,142, we now get a grand total of 3,233. So there we go. I hope this video shed a light on how a simple term like county can mean a lot of different things depending on where you look. These sorts of differences will be the basis of a lot of future videos on this channel. Thank you for watching.